ministry over at King of the Kings, you know, people started coming. Right? The, the Spirit of God started convicting people, and they started coming. And we were baptizing people left and right, and the, the group grew. But at the same time, those that, that were there, you know, I loved them greatly. But there were also some people that, you know, I spent six months catechizing and teaching them about, you know, Lucas Moore Catechism and the Bible and Jesus. And, I mean, these are people who were coming from a given faith. And there were a few that, even though after we baptized, a few months later, they just disappeared. Never came back. And it makes you wonder, you know, you kind of think, you know, what, what, did, what did I do wrong? You feel that way. Like, what did I do wrong that after spending so much time with them in, in Scripture and loving them, even baptizing them, and then they still walk away from the faith later? Like, what did I do wrong? But then, if you look at Scripture, and we look at the Word of God, it says, the Spirit is the one who convicts. The Spirit is the one who gives faith. The Spirit is the one who leads people to Jesus. And so when we, when we understand that, even though we're, we're human and we feel, some, we feel like we should be a part of it, actually we're not. The only part that we have tell them about Jesus. We are sent to tell about the good news. That is the only thing that God has given us to tell about the good news, to love people. It's the Spirit of God. It's He is the one that convicts. And so convicting people is God's job. And so that takes away some of the, the burden that we feel sometimes when we feel like, I've done all this and they still walk away from the truth, and we have some type of guilt. But we have hope that it is God the one that does all the convicting. You know, during the, the, I, during the pandemic, there were a lot of people who had different opinions. I mean, you guys remember that. You know, even here in the Minnesota South District, we had a lot of pastors who, had, who, who were disagreeing on things. You know, a, a third of our pastors says, you know, we should wear masks. A third of our other pastor says, no, we shouldn't wear masks. And the other third says, stop fighting. <laughs> Just get along. And for us as believers, I, and I often talk to some of these pastors, I said, so how we conduct one another, even in our disagreements, will show witness to those who are looking at us. We're going to disagree. No doubt about that. It is inevitable. But how we disagree how we do it gracefully, that is also a witness of God working through us. Even as a pastor, my wife is with me. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, that's, that's unbelievable, right? Even my wife would disagree with me. But we do disagree. But how we do it around people and around and witnessing to, to especially a lot of those who are looking at us as well, you guys are believers, you guys are a follower of Jesus. We're looking to see how you conduct your life. How God works through you. And everything, all those things are witnesses. Even if you don't say it with your mouth, that is a witness. And so God's commandment to us, one of the commandments that, that I read, it says, you know, we shall not covet. It says, one of God's ten commandments is we shall not covet. Says we shall not covet your neighbor's spouse, your neighbor's house, your neighbor's land. I mean, Luther says, you know, don't cover your neighbor's ox and, and the donkeys, and don't cover their, their maid servants, the man servants. Don't cover the things that your neighbors have. And oftentimes, the word covet is used in, in, kind of in, in a negative way. But I said, well, how about, can we use covet in a, in a positive light? Because, you know, I'm one of those people where I always want to use. Look at the positive aspect of life. And said, what if the way that God works through us, what if the way that we love people because of the power of the Holy Spirit that leads us, what if that makes people covet our God? 
spirits shine through us and they see that reflection in us. You know, Bar Barna did a uh, survey of, of religious people and, and Barna found out that a, a third of people understand that they've done something wrong in their past. And there's another third of people understand that their guilt that they carry that has stopped them from moving forward in life. That people carry a lot of burden. People carry a lot of guilt. People carry things that they've done in the past that they can't seem to let go. And if we know that, then what is the answer? The answer is God calls us to be in circumstances in, in life so that we can share with them the good news. I mean, when we look at Acts, you know, when Paul and Silas was, was preaching the gospel and they were put into jail. I mean, this is them being put into jail. They were put into jail and even in jail they were singing and praising God and telling everybody else about Jesus. And that night there was a big earthquake and the door opened and the jailer, the one that was responsible for watching everybody, he said, oh, now the door is open, all these people are going to escape and then I'm going to be executed. And he was about to take his own life. And Paul Silas says, no, 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 no. Nobody's going nowhere. Nobody's going to go nowhere. You don't have to take your own life. But let us tell you about Jesus. Let us tell you about the Messiah. And later on that night, the jailer and his whole family were baptized in their circumstances. And being in jail. In their circumstances, they were still praising singing to God. And so the question that I often ask us as, as believers is, where did we put ourselves in circumstances to be able to witness? I mean, we come together and we encourage one another and we hear God's word and we are forgiven and then we leave this place and we are at peace and we are full of joy. And then when we go out of these buildings, of this wall, this wall, in what circumstances are we around those who are not yet believers. Those who are not yet the sons and daughters of God that God has called them to be. Where are we in that midst? Where are we able to sing praise to God? Where are we able to tell them about the Messiah? About the good news? And so we put ourselves in situations where the Spirit leads us and He opens doors for us that is our opportunity. Don't be afraid to put yourself in hard situations that makes you uncomfortable so that you can share the good news. And there was a, there was a pastor, he, he, he put up a, a, a sign and he says, I want the community to come into our church and give ours, us your critique. Tell us all the bad things that you hate about Christians. He says, tell me all the things that you don't like about Christians and why you don't believe, or why you were never believed. And so people came, people came to the church, and they said, well, you know, the, you church members are no better than anybody else. He says, pastors are crooks, they just want people's money. He says, you know, the church is just full of hypocrites. And at the end of the night, he gathered all the rejections, and he read them all, he didn't even read it, Okay, I've read all these rejections, and all these rejections are against Christians. But he says, none of these rejections was about Christ. It was just all about Christians, but not about my master, Jesus Christ. So let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about his love for you. Let me tell you how much he loves you to the point where he died on the cross so that you may be saved. And later on that night, everybody left. And he says, if anybody is interested in knowing more about this loving God, stay behind. Because he listened to their rejection. He listened to their objection. And about 50 people stayed behind. And he continued to have conversation with them. But it was a hard situation. So they fall in silence. It was a hard situation. They were in jail for preaching the good news. His pastors were not afraid to hear people's rejection. Because by hearing what they thought, 
the Spirit come to us and He convicts the world. And so our job is to get people into a room and have an opportunity to talk to them about Jesus. But then the Spirit of God is the one that does the convicting. Not only convicting them, but convicting us. In Romans chapter 10, it says, How will, and you all know this one, right? And how will they know of those who call him if they have not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without someone preaching to them? How will they know if someone doesn't tell them? But Jesus tells us that we don't have to do this alone. He said, I am going to send you the helper. But the Spirit of God is the one that helps us. And so we're not doing this alone. We have one another. We encourage each other. We inspire one another. But we are not alone. That the Spirit of God is the one that leads us. And so in all of our circumstances, the Spirit of God is the one that empowers us to do this. By ourselves, we will not be able to do it. By myself, I will say this is you know, this is this is hard work. This is hard work. I can't I can't do this. But this hard work that we do, it's also very, very rewarding. When you bring a family, and recently I brought a, you know, a family of, of six, mom, dad, and their children. And you baptize the whole family in front of the congregation. And, and you look at that family and says, yeah, it, all this struggle, all this work was well, well worth it. Because now this, this family here is now a part of the family of God. All the hundreds of people that you talk to that says no to you, and then you have this family that God brings into your midst, and it was all worth it. Or, or when you have my mom who's 85, family, family baptized. Or my son-in-law's mom and dad, who was found back at the age of 60. And he said, it is all worth it. And we have honored and we praise God for that. You know, Larry Hexum, uh, the Lord has called him home last year. But Larry Hexum was one of my shut-ins I, I visited regularly. And, and he had cancer. And he had cancer for about six years. And so he would go into that. He would go into chemo treatment. And every time he would go... And he would always be positive and have this, this happy face on him. But every time he goes in, the whole group and all the other people that are doing chemo treatment and the nurses, you know, they, they know when Larry is coming. Because he's laughing. And, you know, he's always laughing like Pastor Matthew. Right? He's always smiling and laughing. And when he goes in, he just changes the whole environment. And he says, Larry, why are you always like this? And he, and he says, even if I have cancer, I still have joy in the Lord. I still enjoy the Lord. And just his presence changes the environment. But in his suffering, he is still witnessing why he has so much joy. And so today is Pentecost Sunday, and if we go back to the second chapter of Acts, where Peter, where Mary, Peter stands up and, and he tells people about Jesus. He tells them about Jesus the Messiah. He says, he is the Messiah whom you crucified. Jesus is the Messiah whom you crucified. And when he preached that, the people fell down and they said, what must we do? So Acts chapter 2, verse 37, it says, when they heard it, it says, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent. Believe in Jesus. You shall be saved. And it said on that day, over 3,000 people came to be baptized. I mean, how amazing it is that if we can have 3,000 people to be baptized here, that we can baptize 3,000 people in one day. And we think 
pray that God puts you in circumstances to be around those who want to and need to hear the good news so that they can carry and leave their burden and come to the cross to leave an altar of bonds. He says, here's all my burden. And Jesus says, let me take it for my guilt. It's light. And I've come to love you for you are my son and for you are my daughter. You come to me and I will bless you. That